Hello, hello, my safety friends. Good afternoon. Happy Thursday. I hope you guys are doing amazing out there. Thank you so much for joining me on this live webinar. I like to do this in the Facebook group because I kind of feel like it's a benefit of being part of the group where I can share some of my knowledge and, and expertise with you guys. So you do have to be a member of the group in order to do this. I don't share it outside the group. Probably will in the future, but um, right now it's just within the group. But what I'm thinking of is like maybe a month afterwards, uh, taking the recording and put it on YouTube or something like that. So that way you guys could catch the replay there too. And that reminds me, I had some people tell me that uh, they couldn't find last month's training. So I wanna remind you that if you go to the unit section of the group, we do have a unit for just the monthly webinars. So that way you can catch all the replays there as well. Okay, so our topic today is creating effective safety training. So I really, really like this topic because I find so much safety training out there just to be boring as could be. So I'm hoping I can give you some tips to make yours more memorable and make it more effective and all of that good stuff. So let's get started. Um, if you have any questions, you can put them into the comments and I'll either stop partway through or I will definitely answer questions at the end. So you guys know me, I tend to talk a lot. So we're gonna try to keep this at like 45 minutes, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. Maybe I'll do good this time, right? Alrighty, so effective tr safety training. I wanna start with, you know, what makes training effective? So to me, training is effective when it is well understood, when it is relevant, to your operations and to the learner, like it's like the learner actually needs to know this information. When it is remembered, right? Because a lot of times we train people and we think like, I trained you on this, you should know it, but they just don't remember. And when it's acted upon, so like when you actually see people taking the stuff you train them on and actually doing it. To me, that is when it is effective. So to create effective safety training, you really need to focus on the goals that you have for your training. So like really think about like, why am I putting this training in place and what are the goals? So when our goal for the safety training is our check mark to meet the OSHA regulation, it's not gonna be as effective as, I wanna make sure that you understand that when an accident happens, this is, this is the result and I don't want that to happen to you, right? So really focus on the goals. I'm sorry, my mouse is on your screen and I apologize for that. Um, but anyway, you want to focus on the goals and that would help make your safety training more effective. What I tend to see a lot is uh, that we are just like vomiting out regulations instead of really making it relevant to the learner and not putting in any of that wow factor. So I want to tell you guys a story. So I went to a safety conference. Oh my gosh, it had to be 10 years ago, maybe even longer. And I had several employees with me and we were at the keynote, like the, the opening session. I think it was like on day two, day three, whatever, something like that. So we're all sitting there opening session and a guy gets on stage to do some training and he pulled out like watermelons and Diet Coke and Mentos. And he did this whole demonstration that was just, so eye-opening. I mean, it was relevant at the time because it was like he was teaching us how to make our training more effective. But my employees that were with me, because I always take two or three employees with me when I go to a conference, my employees that were with me, they remembered that forever. So like anytime we were talking about hazard communication, they were constantly thinking about the Mentos and the Diet Coke and why you don't mix chemicals together. So it was that wow factor. And obviously it made a pressure on me because here we are 10 plus years later and I'm still thinking about it. I mean, seriously, I think about it several times a year I think about that training. And why was that? It's because it was memorable. So it's that type of stuff that I wanna teach you in today's training on how to make your training more effective. So always be thinking back going, what are your goals and how what makes the training effective? So what you wanna start off with is a needs assessment. A needs assessment is looking at what does my employee understand now and what do they need to understand, right? And what is that gap in between? So the way that you can do a needs assessment is that you can just start questioning, like what do they already know? 
So if you're doing a training on lockout, tagout, you can actually go to the employees and talk about what they know about it. And you might observe them and you might say, okay, what do they need to improve upon? Or you might say, okay, how can I take this training to the next level? What are things that they don't know that could affect them in the future? How can I increase their understanding? When you understand the gap between what the employee knows and what they need to know, you can then tailor your training to match their needs. So that is a needs assessment. So I have a couple of things I wanna share with you. So a really good needs assessment has a match between the trainer's knowledge, the topic, and what the learner needs to know, right? So all of those match up. And when all of those match up, your training's gonna be more effective. And you might not understand that matching up, so let me give you a couple more examples. So let's say that the trainer's knowledge is down here in the topic. So the trainer knows the topic really well and they understand it, but the learner actually knows more. Your training's not gonna be effective because the whole time the learner's gonna be like, why are you teaching me this? I already know, I already know all this, right? So you're gonna have a mismatch, so it's not gonna work as well. Another example is what if the topic is like really high level and the learner doesn't need to know about it. So going back to my lockout tagout example, let's say that you're teaching lockout tagout awareness. You don't need to get into how you lock out machines because the learner doesn't need to know that. So because they don't see any relevance as to how they lock out the machine, it's not gonna be as effective. So make sure that you match them all up. Another thing is when the trainer is not educated, they don't have enough knowledge on the topic, um, as much as what the learner and the topic needs. So a great example of this would actually be for myself, right? People ask me questions all the time about like crane safety or construction safety and all of that. I don't have that kind of knowledge. I have to reach out to another expert to answer those questions. So me training you on crane safety would not be effective you wouldn't even understand it as well or your employees wouldn't understand it as well. So everything needs to just line up nicely. So think about that when you're developing your training is that you want your training to match the needs of the learner. If the learner needs that training, then they're going to be understanding it a lot better. And how another way that you can actually uh, get that information to do your needs assessment is a fun way, right? So if you could do it really fun and you could say, we're gonna do a safety crossword and you know, whoever fills it out, their name goes into a hat for you know, a, a t-shirt or something like that. And then you can see how many people actually filled out the crossword or how many people got it right or how many people answered the quiz right. Have you ever seen, there's a company called AIM for Safety or something like that. I can't remember what AIM stands for, but they do scratch off cards with little questions that people can turn in. And that's another way that you can find out their knowledge on the subject. So that way you're not teaching them something that they already know, right? You could do survey questions. There's another thing, I, have you ever been through TSA at the airport and afterwards they have the little smiley faces and you hit the button, how was your TSA experience? I've seen them in bathrooms too. You can put those out and you can start asking your employees safety questions and you can determine their level of knowledge. So that's kind of like the pre-work before you actually do the training, you can find out what their knowledge level is, right? So let's talk about new hires. So here I am, I'm telling you about doing refresher training basically, because you're able to understand the needs of your learner. But when it comes to a new hire, you don't know their level of expertise yet. You don't know what they know. So you have to actually craft your new hire training in a way that it will meet every single learner. So that means it has to be very basic. You actually have to be ready to teach it to somebody that knows nothing about the subject. And I've had to do this a lot with lockout tagout, using that as an example again, um, where they don't, they've never been experienced to lockout tagout. So they come in, I have to teach them from the beginning. But if I'm hiring a maintenance person, more than likely they understand it. So how are you going to make sure that your new hire training is effective? If you treat every new hire exactly the same, you're just getting your check mark. You're not getting effective training. 
So what you need to do is do a needs assessment of your new hire on that topic. And the best way to do this is at the start of every section, right? So you know when you do new hire training, you go, okay, I gotta cover bloodborne pathogens, I gotta cover HASCOM, I gotta cover lockout tag out, I gotta cover first aid and accident procedures, right? And everyone is kind of like a different section of your training. Stop and have a conversation and go, hey, I'm gonna go into bloodborne pathogens right now. What do you guys know about that? Tell me about it and have a conversation. And then craft your training to the lowest level in that room, which means you can fly by the stuff they already know, just skim by it and spend more time focusing on the stuff they don't know. That's gonna make your new hire training a lot more effective than if you just did a CAN program for the entire team, okay? Now the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is one of my favorite things, because you know how I love the psychology of safety and you know how much I love psychology so when you can actually take psychological um, theories and put them into safety and use them in safety it's just amazing to me so I'm not gonna read this word for word <laughs> but I want you guys to have it so when you download this presentation you can actually see what this is but priming priming is an amazing psychological phenomenon which you should be using in safety and basically what it says is that when you expose somebody to a stimuli they are quicker to respond to a similar stimuli in the future and so what does that mean in a psychological experiment what they generally do is they flash words on a screen and then it's like how quickly you can hit a button to recognize it. They've done it with colors, they do it with um, words, they do it with terms, they do it with pictures, all of that good stuff. So basically what they're saying is if they flash the word doctor and then when the word nurse comes up, you're quicker at hitting it. If they flash a red box, then you're quicker to click on the word red than you are any other color. So what they've taken is they took that minor research and then they applied it to training. And what they have found is that when you actually prime somebody on the subject before you train them on it, they are more likely to understand that training. They're more likely to grasp that information and to be open to learning that information. So how can we prime in safety? So this is what I want you guys to do because it's amazing when you can do it. Prior to the training, you want to start sharing your trending information. You don't want to say, hey, we're going to have a training on hazard communication in two weeks, so read this brochure. No, 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 no. You want to just gently share information with them. <laughs> share your training information. Pop in a newsletter article about the dangers of chemicals. Um, share some accident stories about people that didn't, you know, follow spill clean up procedures correctly. The one that always comes to mind for me is actually more of a confined space is the McDonald's incident where like somebody jumped in and they were both overtaken by the fumes and they both died. But um, you know, you could start doing corrective coaching, right? So you can like actually be coaching on the subject that you're gonna train on and pointing out where they could be doing a better job at it. You could do a focus safety blitz. I actually did a blog post about this where you can get a safety blitz form, so check that out. But you could do a focus safety blitz where you're like focusing on, on hazard communication. This is partly a needs assessment, but it's also priming them for your training. So do all of these little things ahead of time and then what happens when you go to do your training, they walk in and they go, oh, how's our communication training? Oh, that's, that's good that we're doing that because I saw that trending stuff that, that you just shared not that long ago. Oh, yeah, you know, you coached me on this. Now I'm understanding how it all plays together. So you want to make sure that you're kind of like you're pulling them in. You're making their mind a little bit more open to the training. I'm telling you, it is amazing. It is just absolutely amazing when you prime people but you have to actually plan to use priming in your program a lot of people what we end up doing so many times because our jobs are so hectic and so overwhelming is that we don't take the time to work that into our schedule all right so the next thing so here we we have our needs assessment and we have a plan to prime them on our on our training the next thing is we're going to create our training right so when you're creating your training make sure that you're considering what are your goals for your training 
more than just the check mark for regulations and what's your needs assessment, which we already talked about. But then I also want you to consider how people learn and I want you to put things in there that make it memorable. When you combine these four things, your training is gonna be so much more effective. So what do I mean about the way people learn? So you can go on and on into this. This is like a huge in-depth topic, right? So, and you can also get into generational studies with it too. So people generally learn in three different ways. And it's not that like one person learns visually and one person learns auditory and one person learns kinesthetically. What it is is we learn all three of these ways. So what you want to do is make sure that when you're creating your training, you're putting a piece of this into all of it. That's the most important, is that you have some piece of your training that's visual, some piece of your training that's auditory, some piece of your training that is kinesthetic. So if you think about it, right now you're learning about effective safety training. If we were doing this in a setting, right, in like, let's say we were doing it even on an online workshop, visually you've got the video of me and I'm sharing a PowerPoint presentation with you. That would be your visual. Auditory. I'm talking through this whole thing. That would be another way. And then kinesthetic, I would probably give you a workbook to work through, and then I would have you go out onto your floor and actually do assignments or take the stuff I taught you and put it into work. So that's how you can combine all three of those. So if you're doing a safety training, you might, let's say that I'm doing something on fall protection, right? I might throw a video on fall protection. I'm going to sit there and talk about fall protection. But kinesthetically, I'm going to have you done your fall protection and we're going to make sure you're doing it right. So you want to combine all of those. There's other studies out there about, um, let me go full screen on this one, about how much people retain. So let's say that I was training everybody on fall protection and I stood in front of them at a pre-shift meeting and I just talked about fall protection. That is about a 5% retention rate. That means that they're only going to retain about 5% about what I'm telling them. Now if I hand them a brochure or a flyer or a toolbox talk, right, uh, then they're going to retain about 10% of it. And if you think about it, that's the toolbox talks that we do right now. We are handing them a little flyer and we're talking and reading through it. They're only going to retain 10% of it. So what's, let's say that in my training, I add in a video, then that's going to give them 20% retention. Let's say that I do a dummy drop to show them how fall protection works. That's a demonstration. That's going to be 30% retention. Most of your trainings can hit that mark can hit these four things. But there are things, this is passive learning. This is them not doing anything. That's them sitting there in their chair and listening to you or standing there listening to you. When you add in active learning, let me see if my thing, yay, it worked. Um, when you add in active learning, then it actually increases the retention even more. So if you can add in group discussions, I could see that pretty easily being done in a field setting is adding in a group discussion with that. So it, it's not just like going, what do you guys think or tell me about that? It's like giving them something to think about and then talks amongst themselves or talk amongst the group and actually have a full-blown discussion about it. I love to actually start my trainings like this. If you start it with like, where are we at now with fall protection and tell me about it and get everybody talking, where do you guys think we can improve? And then start, the training, they're already in that talking mode. I felt like baby shark there for a second. Oh, you guys can't see me. Um, anyway, they're already in that talking mood. And um, I was doing this. <laughs> I look like baby shark. <laughs> anyway, they're already in that talking mood, so then they're more apt to start adding to the discussion as you go along. Next would be practice doing. So if you can actually take your training out into like the work the work zone and wherever it is they're going to be doing this or practicing the safety behavior, that's even better. Using fall protection as an example, definitely dunning their fall protection, doing an inspection, um, caring for it, all of that good stuff, that definitely helps. And the last one is teaching. Now obviously teaching a subject is going to give, give you the best retention rate, but you can't have everybody teach. If you have a group of like 100 employees, you can't have 100 employees teach. But how you can grasp this and how you can use this to make your training more effective 
is instead of selecting the employees that really understand it, the employees that get, that get it, pick your employees that are struggling to understand it and put them in charge of the toolbox talk on the subject the next week and have them teach it. So that way you're going to be increasing the retention of the subject matter instead of taking somebody who already knows about it and having them do it. So select like your five people that are struggling with that topic and then for the next four or five weeks have them do the pre-shift toolbox talks or something like that to kind of add to it. Okay. And the last one, this is the wow factor. So what you need to add into your training is something that brings an emotional response. So going back to my love of psychology, so when the way that memories work and the way that um, we remember and build habits is that every time we do something, see something, experience something, it builds a neural network. And the stronger that neural network is, the faster it can go and the easier it is to retain that information. So you could be training somebody on something and it has a very weak neural network. I try to think of it as like, okay, you guys are probably, I, I don't know if I share this analogy with you, but I will anyway. So anyway, think about a field that has never been driven on before. And you have your truck and you're going to drive across that field. The very first time you're driving across that field, it's going to be bumpy, it's going to be rough, there is no road, there's no pathway. That's like the first time you train somebody on something. But when you train them over and over again on it, they're going to keep taking that same path and it's going to be grooving the tire marks in there and it's going to become smoother. It's going to be easier to drive across that field. That's the strong neural network. Now, one thing that creates that path quicker than anything is when you have an experience that generates an emotional response. And that emotional response could be, um, you know, something as traumatic as childbirth, right? So it could be, so here's the thing. They've done studies where they have talked to women 50 years down the road and they can literally describe the days they gave birth to a T. I have two kids, my oldest one being 25. I could totally attest to this, right? And why is that? There are so many emotions and so many chemicals running through the body during this time that it's making, it's not like a car going across the field. It is a, uh, it's like a bulldozer going across the field, right? So when you can generate that emotional response, and it's not just like because it was a painful event, um, it's, you know, Everything about childbirth, there's so much that goes in there. It's surprising, it's unknown, it's exciting. It's got all of those things in there. And for those of you that can't relate, um, a lot of us remember where we were on 9-11. I mean, I can describe that day to a T. And why is that? It was shocking. It was awful, right? So it's those type of things. I'm not telling you you need to make a 9-11 event in your safety training, but I do want you to say, okay, how can I wow them? How can I surprise them? Because when you surprise them, everything they just learned is going to make quicker neural network and that way they'll retain it better. All right, so I do have some ideas for you, but nice little shameless plug here. If you have not gotten my a uh, little guide that is the five ways to uh, make employees crazy for safety, make sure that you do, because it has got tons of different ways in there that you can surprise people. I'm sure I'm repeating some of them here, but definitely check that out. And I put a link in the comments as well. So other ways that you can surprise them is to use games. Use music. Music is great for retention. Um, add in prizes, things like that. Um, have like demonstrations too. Jeopardy is an amazing safety training. And I made a Jeopardy PowerPoint. You can actually just Google Jeopardy PowerPoint and you can download one for free and then just design it any way that you want. But here's the thing about Je doing Jeopardy during safety training. You would break your people up into like two or three different teams and then you can set the rules any way you want. I generally didn't do complicated rules. We just kind of went through the, through, the, through the teams and said, pick your topic, and then they got to answer it, and whether they got it right or not, it didn't matter. But, and they would get points, and we didn't have like the other teams coming in and, 
answering the questions. You can play it any way you want. But here's the thing about doing Jeopardy and safety training. You don't have to train them before you play. <laughs> Playing the game is training them. And because it's in such a fun atmosphere, they remember it. I mean, it, it just really just sticks in their brains. So if they have never done HASCOM training before, you can throw them into this and then they'll start picking questions and you're asking them questions and they're going to remember it. I actually used to do this with my new safety managers at the corporate level where I wanted them to learn who to contact for what. And we would actually put like the names of the people they contact as the answers. And it was amazing. And they, it was just like they always knew who to contact afterwards. It was great. So, and it's so much fun. Everybody loves playing Jeopardy. So definitely throw games in there. Another idea is just to do demonstrations. So like the guy who did the watermelon with the hard hat and was dropping heavy things on it, the nail gun into the safety glasses. Everybody loves that one. It's a little dangerous to do, but everybody loves it. The Diet Coke and the Mentos, that's another one everybody likes. The fall protection dummy drop. If you don't have the facility to do this where you actually drop a dummy in fall protection and see how it works, just call one of the companies. They come out, they'll come out and do it for you. So it's pretty cool. And I love doing the bone and the forklift. So you can get like a dog bone and then run it over with a forklift to actually show them why uh, pedestrians need to stay away from forklifts because it'll crush you. So I think that's kind of cool. And I did throw together, excuse me, I did throw together a couple of ideas too. Like if you're handing out brochures, there's this company that makes these little slide things. So that way it's like an interactive brochure and that ends up being a lot more fun and something that they'll actually keep. So if you're giving away prizes, if you can make the prizes relevant to what you're teaching, there's another company that does that too. So, you know, slips, trips, and falls. I used to give out like zero candy bars, you know, for zero accidents. There's the Diet Coke and the Mentos. Safety talks are another great way to reinforce your training, which we're gonna to get to in a moment. And then you could do like a frequently frequent punch card. So like if you attend a safety talk, you get a punch card. And if you fill it up, you get like, I don't know, vending machine coupon or t-shirt or something like that. Um, or even just little promotional items that are related to whatever it is that you're training on. So if you want them to be wearing hard hats, then give them a little stress ball hard hat. You know, that always works and that promotes it too. And there's the watermelon in the hard hat. I always thought that was a neat idea. And then the nail gun and the safety glasses. And you can get these styrofoam heads pretty cheaply too, which is kind of fun too. So that way it kind of looks like a person. Put some googly eyes on them. You could do the styrofoam, or instead of the styrofoam, you could do a watermelon too and do the nail gun, but the nail's going to go right through it. So the styrofoam works a little bit better. But anyway, the idea is that for every training you create, create some sort of wow factor. You know, like if I remember one time training people about the trailers when I worked for the milk company. So in gasoline trailers, you have baffles that actually stop the gasoline from shifting too much in the trailer. You can't have that in milk. A lot of people think it's because it makes butter, but that's not true. It's just there's too much surface area and too much chance for bacteria. But what happens to the drivers when they brake hard, they actually jar their neck. I've actually had several neck injuries from that. So I was teaching them about how the milk is actually moving in the tank. And we just did like colored water in a Coke bottle. And then we passed it around and it's great for new hires because they didn't, a lot of them don't understand that. And they don't understand the impact of driving a milk tanker versus driving any other tanker that's baffled. So that was really interesting. All right, so that's how you wow them. So we have done a needs assessment. We have um, primed them for the training. We've created training that's gonna wow them and surprise them and that meets their needs, right? The training is now done. Your last step is to follow up. So here's the thing. Clarity comes from action. You have to make sure that the people you just trained are actually taking action on the training. If they're not, they're, it's not going to be an effective training. And it's not because you did a bad job. It's because they're not being made to take action, right? So, so many times you get, you kind of get the, the people in the room that are, that'll just sit there. They'll be like, I got my check mark. I'm just sitting there. That, yeah, they are listening, but now you want them to actually take action. So that's where you have to like step in and follow up with them and make sure that they're listening to the training. 
So this is where you want to have your team focus all their coaching to match what you just trained them on and all their observations. If you have an incentive program, switch it up and make the incentives related to what you were just training on. You can give out random prizes. You know, if you do that, I caught you working safely and you give them a vending machine coupon, you could do that when you see them doing something related to what you just trained them on. Or I used to stop people at the gate and then randomly ask them questions. If they got it right, they got, you know, a little token or something like that. You can take your lunch and learns and focus them on the same thing of your training and then even put your awareness materials, focus them on that training. So marketing 101 is that Every, a person needs to see something at least seven times. They have to be exposed to it at least seven times to buy into it. So use your follow-up to get you that seven times so that way your people are buying into what you're training them on. Okay? And one last thing. So here I'm telling you about priming, and then you do your training, and then I'm telling you to follow up. And that can get really confusing. So what I suggest you do is create a calendar where you actually plan it out. If you do a monthly safety training, like pick the day that you're doing the training or the week for that matter, and then you say, the two weeks up to it, I'm gonna put priming activities in there and I'm going to plan those priming activities. And then the two weeks after, I'm gonna put follow-up activities and I'm gonna plan those follow-up activities. And then after that, you're then gonna be priming for your next training. Because generally you would do a safety training every month, if not every week, right? So if you're doing safety training every week, then you want all your topics to kind of focus on each other. But throw in those priming and throw in those, fo those follow-ups and your training will be much more effective, okay? Alrighty, that, actually I did it quicker this month. That, was all that I had for you guys this month. If you have any questions, pop them in the comments. I will be around. I will definitely answer all your questions. Um, I have planned the topic for next month. It's going to be on May 21st at 1 p.m. and our topic's going to be employee engagement. But if you have an idea for another topic, all you do is have to message me and we will put it into the queue if possible, if it's something I can train on. So make sure that you share that with me and I will gladly be covering that topic. Like I said, I like doing these webinars every month in the group, give you guys a different benefit. And that is it for this month. So you guys have an amazing day and I hope this helps you. Oh, and you can download the slides. Um, there is a link in the description. So thanks, bye bye.